So in part one, we talked about this principle of stewardship. And we gave you these laws of stewardship. And that's the foundation, really, of if you, wanna, if you want your, to do it God's way, as far as when it comes to your finances, you need to understand that you are a steward of, of everything. Like, you don't own anything. That's what the word steward means. It means that God's the owner of it all. I'm just the steward or the manager, the caretaker of everything. That was week one. Week two was uh, we talked about the laws of contentment. And that that was like a spirit, a heart that we need to have as we approach finances in life. That we, would need, we need a spirit of contentment. Last week was the laws of harvest, the laws of sowing and reaping. And if you missed any of those, man, I, I just encourage you to, to take a look at God's ways again when it comes to your finances. Maybe you, maybe you heard it in different ways. Maybe, you're, maybe you are a, a victim today of misuse and abuse when it comes to this area, whether it's in, in business or, in, or maybe even in, in the church. And I, my heart breaks for those who've you know, been abused um, in, in all regards. But especially in this area, because this is, you know, this is, the church is something I hold dear. And in this area of our life, I believe that God wants to tremendously bless you. And so many people are living under, um, under a bondage of slavery when it comes to finances. And they don't even know it. But there's a wall that is up, and that wall is a cage. It's a, it's a prison. And, and, and so I encourage you in this, in, this, in this conclusion of this message to, again, if you're new to Discovery, just take that wall down just a little bit. Give me about 30 minutes, and let me just kind of dive into God's Word and show you yet another principle of God's Word that will work for your life if you apply it. Now, the, it, it, it works best when you apply the rest, okay? Can I say that again? That sounded good. It works best when you apply the rest, all right? You just can't, you know, take a little bit of God's Word and a little bit over here, but it does. So if you miss any of the others, go back to it, check them out. But today, I'm going to conclude this series with a, with a very prominent principle in the Bible that is from beginning to end. It's called the principle of first. The principle of first. How many of you know the priority is important to God? The priority is important. There's this principle of first things or first fruits, the Bible calls it. And, and, and let me give you, here's the principle first. Any area you want God to bless in your life, any area, put God first. That's the principle. Any area you want God to bless, you want God to bless your marriage, put God first in your marriage. All right? My wife and I have this, 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 before we even roll out of bed, we hold each other's hands and we pray together in bed. And I bless my wife and my kids, and she prays and will bless me and our day and some meetings we have or important things we have, and we just we pray together. Sometimes I have to turn this way when I talk because I don't want to punish her with my breath. But, I, but it's, uh, we, if you want God to bless your marriage, you put God's, God first in your marriage. If you want God to, to bless your time, you put God first in your time. You want God to bless your business, put God first in your business. And you want God to bless your finances. This is a, a, a financial series, God's Ways Works. Put God first in your finances. This is the principle of first that is all throughout your, your Bible, and I want to teach it to you today. I'm going to teach you a little bit of theology. Is that okay if I get a little teachy at the beginning here? It's important. So many people misunderstand or they, they just don't know really the theological principle of God when it comes to finances in general, but especially this idea of the first things, the principle of first. It reveals some very beautiful things about the character and nature of God that you will miss. You will miss if you don't study and know God's word. So let me, let me kind of do some study, some Bible study with you, if you'll let me, guys. Exodus chapter 13, let's go all the way back to the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 13 says this. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, consecrate, that word there means to set aside, to set aside. To me, he says, all the firstborn... Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, and now watch these three words right here, it is mine. It is mine. This is a declarative Hebrew phrase. In the Hebrew, it's a phrase that means it belongs to me. God is saying it belongs. This is, it's mine. All right, let's continue reading Exodus 13. I'm going to give you the, the, the rest of that chapter, some of that verse before I give you the point. Um, Exodus 13, verse 12 and 13 says, That you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have. The males shall be the Lord's. Notice again the ownership there shall belong to God. But every firstborn of a donkey, and we're going to talk about these animals here, you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. In other words, if you're not going to give the first back to God, you're still going to lose it. 
and all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So what's this talking about here? What is God doing here? The principle of first. What does it mean? Let me give you three points. Write them down with me. Number one, the first must be sacrificed or redeemed. That's what we just read right there from Exodus chapter 13. In this case, it's the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. But how do you know? So how do you know if you either sacrifice it or to redeem it? How do you know which to choose? Whether I'm going to sacrifice something or to redeem it, okay? Well, the Bible, the, the, in the example given, gave two animals. These two animals that were given, the donkey and the lamb, are two, they're examples of the, the characteristics of unclean and clean animals, all right? The donkey represents the unclean animals. The, the lamb represents the clean animal. And here's what he's saying. He says, if your clean animal has a firstborn, then you sacrifice it to the Lord. If your unclean animal has a firstborn, it has to be redeemed or purchased back because it belongs to God with a sacrifice of the clean animal. All right, I'll say, I'll say it again, you guys, one more time because this is so important. We're talking about this principle here, principle first. If your clean animal has a firstborn, it must be sacrificed. If your unclean animal has a firstborn, it must be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Now, what in the world does that represent to us today? I mean, we don't sacrifice animals or anything like that. What meaning does it have for us today? What is God showing us here? Well, let's talk about the way you were born. When you came into the world, into this earth, when you were born, spiritually speaking, before God, were you clean or were you unclean spiritually? You were unclean. Every one of us were born into sin. We were born with a sin nature. What that means is just that we had this bent. We have this bent towards sin in our life. It's just, and if you don't believe me, I'll just ask the experts in the room, ask the parents in the room. How many, let me ask you a question, parents. How many of you had to teach your kids to be bad, right? One of them kind of is, learns it easier than, than the others. Usually that's what happens with your kids. But you don't have, no, you don't have to teach your kids to be bad. You got to teach your kids to be good because we all have this nature, this bent, this, this sin nature. It comes naturally to be, uh, to be bad. So we're all born unclean, unclean before God, spiritually speaking. Let me ask you another question. Was Jesus born unclean or clean? Clean. Okay, listen, listen. The clean had to be sacrificed to redeem the unclean. That's what you just read. That, that, that's, what, that's, what we, that's the principle, the spiritual principle that we just read. We need to understand that this principle, it's a principle of God that Jesus was sacrificed so that we could be redeemed. God gave Jesus. He's called the firstborn. He's actually called the firstborn in the Bible. He's called the firstborn and the first fruits. God gave Jesus and sacrificed his firstborn son so that we could be redeemed. So the first must be either sacrifice are redeemed. Here's the second, prince, the second point I want to give you for this principle of first, and that is that the first fruits must be offered. The first fruits must be offered. When you talk about in the, in, in the, in the financial realm, that first fruits, we call it the tithe. Some of you probably heard that before, and some of you may not, but this, the first fruit says it, it must be offered. That's the principle of first. It has to be offered. Proverbs 3 verse 9 and 10 says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Exodus chapter 23 says the first of the first fruits. So he wants to make sure you're getting it. It's the first of the first things, the very first of the first things of your land. You shall bring to the house of the Lord, your God. Notice the word bring here. God doesn't use the word give when it comes, when, he, when he's talking about first fruits. He only uses the word bring. You know why? Because you cannot give what does not belong to you. If God is the owner and is God's, it, it, I cannot give it. I have to, I bring it. You always bring it to the house of the Lord your God, he says. And sometimes, some people will ask me sometimes like, oh, can I, can I designate, you know, my tithe. No, that, no, it's not yours. You, can I get 5% here, 3% here, 2% there? No, you can. It's not, it's not, you can give offering, but that's God. You trust God and you bring the first fruits to the house 
of God. You think about this, the children of Israel, when they conquered Jericho, the, the, God says, bring me all the silver and gold from Jericho, bring it to the house of the Lord, it's mine. And, and, and you go, well, why didn't God just ask 10% of that? Why not, why not, why do you ask for all of it? Listen, this is why. Because Jericho was the first city that was conquered. See, this principle is all throughout the Bible. It's the principle of first. The first belongs to God. And when you understand this and you live this way, that you put a God first life, that God is first in your time, that God is first in your day, that God is first in your agenda, in your goals, that God is first in your marriage, in your business, that God is first in your finances, that your vats will brim over, it says. You will overflow with God's blessing when you operate by this principle of first things. I get asked the question sometime about Cain and Abel. Some of you guys probably heard about that, that, maybe even wondered this. Like, why did God accept Cain's offering, but not, or did not accept Cain's offering, but accepted Abel's? You ever wonder that? See, when you understand the principle of first, you, you see clearly why God, God did not accept Cain's offering, and he accepted Abel's offering. Let me show it to you in your notes. In Genesis chapter 4, it says, in the process of time, it came to pass. Like it just, just kind of happened as time came on that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Notice it doesn't say the first fruits. It was just an offering. It was just, a, just some offering. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. Did you see it? It's pretty clear now when you understand the principle of first. See, see Cain was a farmer, and it says that, that, that he didn't bring the first fruits. He just brought some of his crop when he felt like in the process of time, you know, Abel is a rancher, and he brings the firstborn, and God says, I'll accept that. I won't accept that. And, and by the way, this is 2,500 years before the law was given. And I know tithing is not under the law. Look, this is not a law for you to obey. Please do not receive this and miss the principle that God is, 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 puts in the Word of God, in the Bible for a reason, that I know we're not under the law, and this is not a rule to obey. You are not to, to follow God based on rules. You are supposed to follow God based on relationship. So don't miss this, please. And so many people miss this because, oh, because in the Old Testament, that's under the law. Well, come on now, man. It's also in the law to do not commit adultery. But you, you obey that one, don't you? That one's in the Ten Commandments. That's Old Testament. How about do not steal? That one's in, that's in the law too. We still know that's good law. That's, that's, that's a good one. Honor your parents and your, and your mother and your father. I mean, that's, we understand that that's, that's good. So don't miss this, you guys, that the principle of the first things belong to God. They're God. They're holy, he says. You consecrate that. When you, when you operate by this principle, I'm telling you, everything, here it is. When you, when you put God first, when God is first in your life, everything else is in order. Everything falls in order. But when God is not first, everything's out of order. It's all out of order. It's all from the top down. It's out of order. You wanna, let, me, let me give you a little theology on this point too. Let me, a little bit deeper here. Um, God, God could, did not just you know, not accept Cain's offering, but God couldn't accept Cain's offering. He couldn't. You say, wait a second. Well, I thought God could do anything. I mean, he's the God of miracles, God of the impossible. What are you talking about? Yeah, well, God can do anything that does not contradict his nature. God, let me say it this way. God, God can't do something that is in contradictory to who he, who he is. So there are some things that God can't do. Like, for instance, God can't lie because God is truth. God doesn't just speak truth. God is truth, so he cannot lie. So let me give you some things, that, that a few things that God can't do. God can't change. In theology, this is called the immutability of God. The immutability of God. It means that God can't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the reason why God can't change is because if he could change, he could get better. And God can't get better. He's just the best. Okay? This is the immutability. He's perfect. Okay? So God, God can't change. Another thing that God can't do is God can't think the way we think. You ever think about that? Like God, God understands what you think. God can sympathize what you think, but he cannot think the way that we think. The theological word for this is omniscience. 
You may have heard that. It comes from the Greek, two Greek words, omni in science. Omni meaning all, science meaning knowledge, that God has all knowledge. He can't think like you. You're, you know, it, let me even put it even more perfectly. God does, no, no, not only has all knowledge, but he has all knowledge at all time. Okay? So he, 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 the reason why he can't think the way we think is because when we're thinking, we're trying to figure stuff out. See, when God is, God, God's never trying to figure something out. Nothing has ever just occurred to God like, oh, well, I had a great idea. I just thought of something I never thought before. This is just, this, is, this will be great. Let's try this. That never happens. Now, God, God uh, he, he, he cannot think the way that we think, all right? And, and Isaiah, Isaiah backs this up. Isaiah says, um, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. He says, I can't think like, you can't think like me. My, my, my thoughts are as far as the heavens are from the earth, so are my thoughts from your thoughts. I'm telling you, you think about this for too long, you're going to trip a breaker, okay? Because you just, you just cannot comprehend the mind and the nature fully of God. You just can't. So there's some things that God can't do. Okay, let me tell you how this kind of relates to Cain's offering. God can't be second. He can't. This is, this, this in, in, in theology, this is called the preeminence of God. That's, that's what that is. The preeminence of God, it means he's higher than all, he's above all, he's first of all. He's first. That's what that means. He is preeminent. You want to get even literal. He is before the first. Okay, that's what that means. Like he is even before the first. Now we, we, we'll say, you know, put God first in your lives, and it's a very good statement. It's a good analogy, but let me just clarify to you that if God is not first in your life, he is still first in the universe. He, just because you don't put him first doesn't mean he's not first. He is first. He is preeminent, okay? And so when Cain gave an offering in the process of time, God said, I can't accept that. I can't, I can't accept that. Cain gave what he wanted when he wanted, and God says, that doesn't work. I can't, I, it's against my nature. I cannot even, I can't go there, Cain. That's against not who I, who I am. It's, I, can't, I can't do that. This is the principle of first. I'm telling you, when you get this, you start living your life with a God first in every area. Every area will be blessed. Every area will be in order when you live by the principle of first. The first fruits must be offered. Here's number three, and that is that the tithe must be first. The tithe must be first. Why is that? Simple. Because it belongs to God. It's, it's his and God is first. The firstborn belong to God. The first income belongs to God. Leviticus 27, 30 says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. I'd be doing you a disservice talking about God's ways and talking about finances if I didn't touch this, even though some of you, I can sense it, are putting up walls even, even as I, I speak. Um, it belongs to him, the Bible says. It is set apart. Some say, well, well, you say the tithe belongs to God. Doesn't it all belong to God? Yes, it does. But God does not say to return it all to him. He says to return the first part, the tithe, for us to walk in faith. He wants you to walk in faith in your relationship with him, to trust him, and he wants to bless you, but you have to step out and trust God with the first part. Look back in Exodus with me, where we started, Exodus chapter 13, uh, verse 14 and 15, because God kind of paints a picture as why, like why, 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 why live this way? He connects it kind of to this legacy thing. He says, so it shall be when your son asks you in time to come saying, what is this? Like, why, dad? Why do you, why do you do that? Why do you put the first? Why do you why do, you, why do you, you know, give the first? Why, why? What are you doing with that? That you shall say to him, by the strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beasts. Therefore, son, let me just tell you, I gladly sacrifice to the Lord all the males and the open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons, I redeem. Let me kind of paint this picture for you because this is so important. This is so important for you to get this, man, because God's ways work, the principle of first. Let me paint the picture. They got this rancher family, okay? You got a rancher family, and, and, and son's out there playing, and he runs in. He runs in from the farm, and he comes into the house. And he says, guys, guys, the lamb had a baby. 
it's here. It's here. And the family goes, all right, finally she gave birth. And, and then everyone goes out, all the family, all the family go out to go see. And, and the dad on his way out grabs the butcher cleaver. And they go out, they see the lamb and, oh, look at the pretty lamb. Oh, look, he, he, he's so cute. He's, oh, he's trying to walk on the pretty lamb. Look at him. Look, and they're just like, oh, look at the life. It's such life. It's life. And then, and then dad comes up, grabs it by the hind legs, lifts it up and slits it throat. You know what the kid's thinking right now, right? The kid's going, don't mess with that. That's what you don't know. <laughs> whatever, I, don't, I don't know what the lamb did, but whatever the lamb did, I know not to do. Just don't do, don't do that. Dad, dad's, dad's a mean dude. Okay, but this, this happens over and over again. The firstborn, I mean, dad's like just, just, just killing animals, and the, and the kids see it. The son sees it. Well, the son grows up seeing this his whole life. He goes off to college, gets a degree, comes back home, and the dad goes, hey, I want you to come into the family business. I want you to manage the books. Will you manage the books for the business? Sure, dad, I'll manage the books. So the son starts managing the books, and after some time, the son starts seeing, wow, wait, he starts noticing something that maybe the dad doesn't notice. Maybe, maybe he doesn't get this. Maybe he's old school. Maybe, 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 you know, maybe he just needs a little help. I mean, everyone has blind spots. Maybe, maybe I can help my dad out here. So, so the son asks the dad to come into the office. You know, hey, dad, can I show you something? Why don't you come on into my office? Can you leave the knife, though. Leave the knife right there. Come on in, dad. Come on in. Have a seat, dad. You know, I just, I just, I mean, you asked me to manage the books. I manage the books for the, for the business, the family business. And, you know, we're in the rancher business. I know you know, I know you that. But, but, you know, we all have blind spots, dad. Maybe you got a blind spot, and I'm just trying to help you out, dad. And I was looking at the books here, and I'm noticing, like, you know, for years, Dad, you've been killing. You, you kill the firstborn of every one of our flock, of, of, of every one of them. And, and, um, and, and, and I've counted it. You've got 73. You killed 73. Of, and Dad, we're ranchers. Like, that's, that's income. That's like, and you know what? I did the math, and we could really use that. We would be so far better off if you were to just not do Can I ask you, Dad? Why, why are you doing, do you know? Because maybe you don't know that you're doing this. Like, why are you, why are you doing this, Dad? And, and, and the Bible says, God says, there's going to come a day where your sons, your children will ask you, why do you live a God-first life? Why, 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 why do you live the way you live? Why do you get up in the morning early and put your, why do you read the Bible? Why do you give God the first of your time? I actually had my daughter. One day she came out, it was in the dark, and I'm reading my Bible, and she just came, and she seen me do it enough, and she says, Dad, why, why do you do that? And I got to tell her, I said, honey, because once your daddy wasn't always saved. Your daddy wasn't always a pastor. Your daddy, once your daddy was lost, once your daddy was, was full of sin and selfishness, broken and, and beat up by life. But by God's mighty hand, he delivered me from my bondage and from my slavery. And now I gladly... I gladly, my dear, I gladly give the first of everything to God. It's his. And I don't listen. I don't do it out of a rule to follow. Please don't do that. It won't be blessed if you do that. It's, it, is, it is my pleasure to give God the first of everything. It belongs to him. And it hurts me. It kind of hurts inside when, I, when people talk negatively or critically about the first fruits and about the tithe because they just don't understand that it's a character of God. And actually, it's in the word of God. The reason, like, have you ever thought of this? Like, why did God even invent the tithing? Did you know that, like, like a preacher didn't invent tithing, okay? Pastors didn't invent tithing. It wasn't. God did it. And, and I asked my small group years ago this question. I asked them, I, I said, why do you think it came up? We we're talking about finance. I said, why do you think God invented tithing? He said, well, to, to support the work of the ministry, to support God's ministry. That's why, that, that's why, that's a practical reason. Can I ask you something? I want you to think about this. Honestly, think about this. Do you really think that God needs your money for his work? I mean, this is, this is the God of the universe who, who brings water from rock and manna from heaven. Do you really think he needs your stuff? No, he did not invent the tithe for himself. He invented it for you so that you can learn to walk by faith. And there is a reason. There is a reason because we all have this natural bent towards our sin nature and selfishness. And God instituted this principle to keep us aligned, to live a God-first life. See, it doesn't take faith to give the last part. It, gives, it takes faith to give the first part. The principle 
a first. This is all throughout the Bible, but look at Malachi chapter 3. Not in your notes, but verse 9 before that verse in your notes. Up here on the screen, it says you're under a curse. Your whole nation. I mean, you wonder why you're, you, you can't get out of debt. You wonder why it's not working out. You wonder why you keep increasing your income and getting promotions, yet, yet, yet it's just never, never really enough. Well, because you're robbing me, God says. You're robbing me. So, so you, when it comes to the tithe, you have two options, okay? There's only two options when it comes to the law first, when it comes to your finances. You can either bring it or steal it. That's it. I mean, you, you, you can't keep it. You can't really keep it. What does it mean when you keep something that doesn't belong to you? You're a thief. Yeah, those are the two options. He goes on to say, hey, bring this. And there's a reason. Look, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And that's the local church. It literally means the house of God, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. This is the only part of the Bible. God says this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. And look, here's, here's what God will do. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, not for the kingdom's sake, but for your sake, so that there we will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Um, I'm telling you, there's, there's, here's the reason why most people don't tithe. They say, Pastor, I'd love to tithe. I just can't afford to tithe. Can I tell you something? Please hear me. You will never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. Because it's the tithe that breaks the curse, that rebukes the devourer, okay? It is the only, it is, it is what blesses the rest is the tithe. The first part redeems the rest, it either needs to be sacrificed or redeemed. See, the first part of your income, you sacrifice it so the rest can be redeemed. This is the principle of first. I'm just trying to teach you some theology behind what maybe you've just been practicing or what maybe you've been hearing. There's a reason why God is, is, is has, so God does it for you. He wants to bless you. Oh, but isn't this just an Old Testament thing? You know, isn't this a, just, it, it, just a, a rule, a law? It's just, no, let me show you what Jesus had to say about it. Matthew 23, verse 23. Jesus talking to the Pharisees, he says, man, woe to you Pharisees, you other, you religious leaders, you're hypocrites, for you tithe down to the last mint leaf in your garden, but ignore the more important things like justice and mercy and faith. Yes, you should tithe. This is Jesus. Yes, you should tithe, but you shouldn't leave the more important things undone. See, it's not even about the tithe. It's really not about your fine. It's not about what you can bring. He said, there's more important things. What's that? Your heart. That's what it is. Here's what Deuteronomy says, 14. The purpose of tithing was to teach you always to put God first. It's the protective mechanism that God created because we all have a sin nature that moves and bends itself, leans itself towards selfishness in sin that God said, if you just redeem the first part of it, I have the power to bless the rest. That's the principle of first fruits. Jesus connected this to our heart in Matthew chapter 6. He said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. You've read this before. Where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Listen, we can say, we can say all day long, God's ways work. Oh, and God is first. But if he's not first in this area, then he's not first in our hearts. I mean, that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So really, the principle first, it's not about what you bring. It's about where your heart set is. That's what this is. It's, it's, the principle of first was always, always established by God to get your heart aligned right before him. And I'm telling you, just test it. I challenge you to apply God's ways to your finances, the whole stewardship thing, the contentment, sowing and reaping, the principle of first. You will be blessed in every way. But listen, Psalm 62 gives you just, just this, this um, warning. He says, though your riches increase, do not set your hearts on them. Don't set your hearts on them. So where, let me ask you a question. Where is your heart set today? Where is your heart set today? Now don't compartmentalize your life and say, well, over here, it's set here, it's set here, it's set here. No, no, no. Where is your heart set today when it comes to your, fi- where, where is your treasure? Where is your heart set? And I'm telling you, if you just get your heart set on the right thing, 
then everything else will be in order. It really, listen, it doesn't, it's not about the money. It's not about you bringing anything. I don't want nothing from you. Trust me, I don't. I, I'm trying to lead you to put your heart right, put your heart right before God, to set your heart, which now begs the question then, where should my heart be set? Where should I set my heart? The Bible, let me give you three things that the Bible says to set your heart on. Three things that I believe you can apply today. And I'm telling you, God's ways work. Write them down. Here's the first thing. The Bible says it sets your heart on giving, not getting. Man, I'm telling you, you'll be so much happier if you just understand this. You went out Black Friday shopping. You went and elbowed people and mowed over old ladies and stuff. And you went and got that TV or that, that new hoverboard or whatever it was. You went, everything that you're going to get this Christmas, listen, is either going to break wear out or burn up, okay? Every single thing. Everything is. It's, it's, you need to set your hearts on giving, not getting. Set the heart on giving. I mean, it's more than just your finance. I'm, not, I'm talking about your uh, others' focus. How can you add value? How, what can I do for others? How can I give myself for others? Giving your time and your gifts and, yes, even your, your treasure. Jesus said in Acts 20, he said, you're far happier giving than getting. I mean, that's the truth. And those, those of you that have been generous know that, that, that you are so much happier when you're able to give to others than you are needing and being the person receiving. Here's what, what God wants to do for you. You look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It says, you will be made rich in every way. Now, don't take the Bible out of context here, which some people kind of do with this, with this verse. Yes, God wants to make you rich in every way, not just financially, but in every way and for a specific purpose. What is that? So that you can be generous on every occasion, so that you can do more random acts of kindness, so that you can give more of your time and your treasures and your talents. Focus, set your heart. You want to set your heart right? You want to get it aligned right? Set your heart on giving, not getting. All right? Here's number two. Set your heart on true riches. Set your heart on true riches. Yep, everything under that Christmas tree ain't going to last, okay? The true riches, you, wanna, you might want to write this down right next to it. Just write people. That's what true riches are. True riches are people. They're not things. And it's my delight to lead this church every year to a greater things offering so that we can make an impact in people's lives in, in our city and around the world. Why? Because people are what matter to God. They are the true riches on this planet, the only thing that will last forever. Amidst the hustle and bustle, you need to remember that this season. Amidst all the hustle and bustle of this season, it's the people, God, it's your wife, it's your husband, it's your kids, it's your, it's your friends. Those are the things, those are the true riches. Look what Luke chapter 16 says with me. I'm explaining it to you because this can get confusing. It says, and I say to you, Jesus saying, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. That's money that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you or to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either will hate one and serve the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. I know this is a confusing passage. Some people actually think that this means that you're to use your money to like make friends and leverage your money over people so that you can, you know, that's not what it means. Jesus says, you take unrighteous mammon, and, and by the way, your, your, money, your money has either one of two spirits on it. And it depends on what you do with it. Your, your money either has the spirit of God on it because you follow God's ways and God's principles, or it has the devil's spirit on it because you didn't, all right? And it depends on what you, what you do with it. That is, that is a fact. And he says, take that unrighteous and make it righteous. Redeem it. How? By following God's ways, the principle of first. I sacrifice the first, and it redeems the rest, I'm telling you, this is the principle of first. And then it says, so that when they fail, and that's the confusing part because that's a bad translation. That word fail in the Greek, it means the word death. So, so literally it is so that when they die, they're in heaven going, thank you so much for buying that coffee for me. That was the day 
that I gave my life to Jesus when you gave me that little random act of kindness card. Thank you so much for the, you made a difference in my in my life, they're going to get to heaven one day because of that. Jesus is saying, understand what true riches are and leverage everything you have for the only thing that matters on earth, and that's people. Here's the last thing Jesus says. The word of God says to set your heart. You want to get, I'm telling you, get the first, you get your heart right before God, set it right, and everything else will fall into order. This is the principle of first. Just get it right. Get your heart right. Look, none of the rest of the stuff matters. I mean, you, you say, oh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. I don't care. That's okay. I'm okay. You know what? God's okay that you're unsure about things. That is fine. Just get your heart set right, and I promise you, God will work it out. God will work out the, the, the rest. It'll fall into place. Here's the last place. It really is the first place. You need to set your heart, and that is set your heart on Christ. Set your heart on Christ. You see, really, when it comes down to it, the reason why we become unfaithful with the resources, with the blessings, with the, with, the, with the gifts and the seeds that God give us so generously, let's admit it, our hearts get, get set on the wrong things. That's why we become unfaithful in this area. I allowed this to take precedence over what's important. I allowed some things, just a cloud to confuse, to take precedence and priority in my heart and in my life. See, I lost sight, God, of, of why I'm here and what you've given me, and what I'm really supposed to do with it, I, I, I set my heart on the wrong things. Look at Colossians chapter 3 says, it says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts. Where? On things above. Don't get caught up on this world. Don't get caught up in the things of this world. You are not of this world. This world is not for you. You are, you, this is not your home. He says, get, set your hearts on things above. Look at this. I love it. Where Christ is. That's where your heart should be. Our hearts should be where Christ is. Wherever Christ is, that's where I want my heart to be. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Come on, let's do that right now. Let's set, let's set our hearts together. Come on, bow our heads and close our eyes. Can we set our hearts right 